Well, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Dave Reist, and I work here at the Potomac Institute. Uh, on behalf of Mike Swetham, our CEO, and General Al Gray, uh, Chairman of our Board of Regents and the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, it's, it's a pleasure on their behalf to uh, welcome you today. The, uh, a few things about some of the cyber seminars we've had here. Uh, this is the seventh one that we've, thank you, the seventh one that we've dealt uh, with, with the cyber issue. And uh, uh, one of the personalities is a, is a familiar face and two of those, Ambassador Smith, and I'll talk about them in a few minutes. But uh, what we've done at this, at this point in time is we've addressed some of the issues in the cyber from the policy perspective, and that's really the charter of, uh, of, of Potomac here. Uh, we take a look at those thorny issues in the academic and in, and in that area, and we uh, like to uh, wrestle with it. And I think we've been pretty successful as we've looked at uh, some of the policies that government and the uh, uh, in, uh, government uh, and the private sector uh, interface and uh, deterrence and some of the issues of, of cyber. This one, though, is a little bit different and uh, something a little bit more familiar to me, being a former Marine, in the area of almost like a battle study, that you can deal with some people that have uh, been on the ground, kind of seen it, felt it, and put some practicality against it. And I think that's why we, first of all, why we have such a great crowd here today, and we thank you for that. And uh, we look forward very much to hearing uh, hearing their thoughts. Um, you've got two of the uh, bios, and I won't uh, I won't uh, spend a lot of time. Ambassador Smith uh, has participated in two of our cyber uh, uh, cyber panels. I I'm always amazed to hear his thoughts. Uh, and you will today. So, Dave, I set you up. So, if you fail, it's, your, it's on your, it's on you. Uh, next, sitting next to him is Katuna Mishfitabazi, and uh, did I, I was probably You're close enough, Katuna. Okay, <laughs> I'm an American. I'm sorry. Uh, Katuna, though, uh, I've heard a lot about you. And when we started putting this cyber program together, we thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to have a panel where we could bring somebody from Georgia who's played in this arena and let them talk. So for this to come to fruition when we first started talking about this a year ago, this is a real pleasure. And on behalf of uh, uh, Mike Swetnam, uh, she's an academic fellow with us. There's a little help in to make it official. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. To close it out, uh, at the end, after Dave and Katuna speak, We've got uh, Michelle uh, Maskoff, Senior Advisor of Cyber Issues, Office of Secretary of State. Uh, I'm told, Michelle, you've worked cyber issues for about 13 years now. You've got a strong background in uh, arms control and Soviet studies, a uh, graduate of Reed College and two degrees from Yale, and you're also a graduate of the uh, National War College. So uh, impressive set of credentials, great speakers. Uh, the theme here is they'll talk, and then you get to ask questions, hopefully they throw the right thoughts out there that, uh, that generate some great thoughts in your mind, and then you force them to answer some very hard questions from your side of the house. So it's a tennis match that will go on later on, but hit the ball back at them just as they're throwing it to you. So Dave Smith, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. General Reese, thank you very much. And uh, Laurie, can we get the video? And my clicker is here. Uh -huh. Katuna, you're going to have to move from here. Can I just suggest you come and just yeah. move your chair and move over here? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank General Reese for the very kind uh, introduction um, and uh, all the people who have worked on this. I'd like to um, uh, thank also, there's somebody who's always has to do extra, extra work to get these things together. Um, Lori Kinney, who is standing back here, thank you very much for all your efforts to get this thing going. Uh, I'm also very pleased, in addition to be joined by Khatuna Mishvidovadze from Georgia, uh, that a very old friend, Michelle Markov, has agreed to uh, come and join us. Uh, a real expert in the field, uh, somebody uh, at the top of the uh, State Department working on these issues and someone who knows also Soviet Union and Russia quite well, so and has a lot of experience uh, doing things. So it's a real pleasure uh, to be back somewhere with you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, 
If you're a WTOP uh, junkie listening in the car, you probably heard something yesterday. General uh, Lieutenant General Ronald Burgess, uh, the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, going through a sort of what are the threats out there. And um, he, uh, OK, now I'm being handed a new device. <laughs> I'm assuming that pushing the right one makes something yes, it go. Does. Ha! <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and I was just struck by a one-liner. You know, he was going through international terrorism, Iran, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, and I wouldn't take Russia off the list. Uh, that's a really important statement because, frankly, I think we've been deluding ourselves a little bit about the nature of Russia. And if we're going to start talking about Russia and cyber and that sort of thing, I think it's very important to keep in mind the nature of the country uh, about which we are speaking here. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these quotes, but if you just Google Russia cyber, uh, you will come up with this kind of stuff. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, the counterintelligence executive issued a report. There it is up on the top. Uh, there we go, Russia. Um, another interesting quote from Dick Clark's book um, about the comparable skills of, for example, Russia and China, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to hear a little bit. There's a reason why this presentation comes partly from Georgia, because Georgia has been the victim of a combined kinetic and cyber attack from Russia. So I think it's a, it's a timely topic. It's a, it's a good reason to, to take a look at this thing. Now, when we do that, uh, please don't feel uh, that I am uh, in any way trying to tell you things you already know. Some people are quite familiar with Soviet Union and then Russia. Uh, but sometimes Americans aren't. And I think it's useful when you're talking about uh, Russia to sort of bear a few things in mind. Every culture, we all do it. We mirror image. <coughs> Uh, it's natural. But when you're looking at another culture, you need to try very hard not to do that. Just a few points about Russia when you take a look at this country. Uh, first of all, this kind of work. You know, there's no comprehensive publicly available cyber policy where you can go to the book and say, yes, in chapter 7, sub, 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 sub chapter 7C, Russian cyber doctrine says this, 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 and this. That doesn't exist. You take what you can get. Some of it is a knowledge of the culture. Some of it is snippets that you find on the internet or in newspapers. You look at official documents, official statements, and you try and put together with their actions, you try to put together a, a coherent story. When somebody says, can you prove that, the answer is no. This is open source analysis, open source intelligence, if you will. No, you can't prove that. Being able to prove something like that is called history and you do it after the fact. This is the best analysis we can give at this time. Uh, the Russians see cyber operations a little differently than we do. They see cyber operations as part of information operations. It's a much more comprehensive view of the world. It's information operations, and information operations go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, whether in peacetime or wartime. It may become information warfare, or it's information operations, but it never ends. This is a constant effort. It is not a, we must do this, therefore tonight we will do that. That's not how they see it. The other thing we need to remember is Russia was not hatched in a vacuum. This is a country with a long, long history. The Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, even the Yeltsin years are part of, of the thinking of modern Russia. You don't just start like that in 1991 or in 2000 and say, this is Russia, and this is how they think. There's a lot there that has to be strained through. The other thing that we have to think about, that part of that legacy, is Russians tend to see things in geopolitical terms. Um, they don't believe the world is flat. Uh, they don't believe the world is globalized. They don't think everything is universal. They see things in what I would call classic 19th century geopolitical terms. Let's just give you one example. The attack on Georgia in 2008 was 100% a geopolitical attack. That is a very important piece of territory. It is a piece of territory that is the only non-Russian controlled access to the Eurasian heartland. 
It was being used by the West, and they didn't like it, and they attacked it. Make no mistake, this was a war that took place in Georgia. It was not a war about Georgia. It was a war about geopolitics. It was a war on Western, particularly American, interests. Um, fifth, Russia regards the United States and NATO uh, and their friends like Georgia and Estonia as the enemy. Now, we can scoff at that all you want, but you listen to Russian politicians, read Russian newspapers, see what they say, <coughs> they feel threatened. Now, I believe that's irrational. I believe it's unjustified. Many things that I may say about that, but the way they see it is they see us as the enemy. Corruption is the dominant force in Russian politics. Corruption <laughs> governs everything, and as you'll see when we talk about cyber, that makes a difference. And finally, there's a very blurred line between external and internal. Um, they see internal opposition as a threat to the state as well. These are also enemies. And if cyber weapon is useful against external enemy, as Fortuna is going to show you in a few minutes, it's also useful <coughs> against internal enemies. So what you get here is, I think this is an important concept to try to understand the way they approach uh, cyber security, cyber capabilities. There is a very unique nexus of government, crime, <coughs> and business in Russia. It's something sometimes Westerners have a hard time. Imagine if you had a reception, and Director Webster, the FBI, was in attendance, and somebody told you the next morning that, and two seats down was John Gotti. It, to an American mind, that's absolutely <coughs> inconceivable that the director of the FBI would knowingly be sitting there with a known crime figure. Okay? This is not strange in Russia. There is a circle. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody in the government is a criminal or that all criminals are in business or all businessmen are criminals <coughs> in the government. Obviously, there's, there's, there's a, a division of labor there. I mean, people are doing different things. But there is a circle there of people that are the in crowd. And the in crowd uh, does certain things. So I think it's very important uh, to remember that this is a little bit different because we're going to talk a minute, uh, in a minute about Russian organized crime involved in cyber capabilities, particularly involved in the attack on Georgia. Um, it's the Russian state. It's this, this is the same crew of people that are doing this. So let's take a look back a little bit. I'm not going to go back to Peter the Great. We do have another briefing. It's a little longer where we actually go back to Peter the Great. And we start in the Sea of Azov. And, but I won't do that. Okay. Um, let's just go back to Marshal Ogarkov. Uh, back in the USSR. Um, I think this is important, though, because so let's go back to the dawn of the cyber era. This is stuff is not new to a lot of thinkers on the subject. Marshal Ogarkov, whatever you think of the man personally, was a brilliant man. He was the commander of the group of Soviet forces in Germany. He came back to be the chief of the general staff and then went off to be one of the major thinkers in Russian military thinking, was the architect of what he called the military technical revolution. And he made the argument, computers are going to change everything. It's going to be a completely different war. It's not your father's tank. This is going to be a completely different situation as we look to the future. Americans, as Americans do, uh, hijacked the concept, renamed it, repackaged it, made a PowerPoint briefing about it, and called it the Revolution in Military Affairs, which people who study military things can tell you in the mid-90s forward was a major, major theme uh, in American thinking. Remember that on the Russian side, they started with Ogarkov, and that thinking to today has to be strained through a Marxist-Leninist Soviet thinking. It has to be strained through the Yeltsin years. What happened with the Yeltsin years? Well, a couple of things. Let a thousand flowers bloom, if I can borrow from the Chinese for a moment. Um, there's a lot of thinking, a lot of things going on. Uh, the sort of the, the kinds of guys that you're seeing now out on the blog site still with the courage to oppose uh, the current regime, those guys were hatched back in the 90s when everything was OK. Also, there was no money. And when there was no money in those lean years, there was a lot of theorizing. 
not a lot of building, not a lot of doing, but their theorizing about cyber capability is frankly more advanced than ours. They've written and thought a lot about this. Why? Because in the 90s, they didn't have any money to do anything else but write and think. And so what is some of that thinking? Um, the title of this slide uh, was a little different. Rapuna made me change it. The, um, the title of this slide was, give me a break, my mother gave me this sweater. <laughs> um, this is Colonel Simbal, who was one of those thinkers from the 90s. And he left us, I think, with a very articulate, look, this is how we see it. Information warfare takes in all of these things. This is what I meant by that comprehensive view. It's intelligence, it's counterintelligence. It's masking things, maskirovka. It's disinformation, it's electronic warfare. We make that distinction. Are you talking about cyber warfare? Are you talking about electronic warfare? How many times have you heard that discussion? It's all the same thing. We're just talking about different tools. Uh, debilitation of communications, degradation of navigation support, psychological pressure, degradation of, Amer of, 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 of uh, uh, the enemy's information systems. It's all put together. Now, if you have any doubts about this being warfare in their mind, here's more from our man with the sweater. Um, I won't read it for you, but you can basically see the point. This stuff is important. It can substitute for uh, traditional kinetic military means. And by the way, it's so potent that it might be equivalent to nuclear weapons. And by the way, make no mistake, this was not invented in the Pentagon a couple of months ago. If we feel threatened by this stuff, we will consider it warfare, whether there's a shot fired or not, and we reserve the right to retaliate with whatever means necessary. This is back in the 90s. This is not last week. This is not a couple of months ago. This is back in the 90s. And then also back in the 90s, the then uh, chief of staff, um, General Colonel uh, Samsonov, um, talking about basically war without tanks. Now, what do we see against Georgia? Uh, Hatuna's going to go through a little, a couple more details. But what did we see against Georgia? We saw the not complete, but the partial substitution of cyber means for kinetic military means. Certain missions that heretofore had been assigned to kinetic means, such as artillery uh, at the beginning of the battle, etc., were assigned to cyber. This is something they've been thinking about. I guess they're still thinking about it. And in their most recent military doctrine, um, this phrase appears. The prior implementation of measures of informational warfare in order to achieve political objectives without the utilization of military forces. The reason I'm harping on this is twofold. One, I'm trying to make the point, to underscore the point, the Russians are thinking about this stuff. There's a lot of theoretical work going on. They are thinking about this stuff. And I think that in itself is worth, is worth noting. Um, I think the other thing that is worth noting is we are really hung up in this country and other Western countries on the uh, idea of, is it really warfare? If something doesn't go boom, is that warfare? Do they have to do kinetic damage for it to be warfare? What would, tr what would trigger our retaliation? What would be justifiable? They've already worked the problem. They, they know what they think. We don't know what we think. But theorizing is nice, but then there were some wake-up calls. The first Gulf War. I got to tell you, I was a US negotiator at the time. And I sat across the table from one of their top military engineers and a very decent man, by the way, uh, three-star general. And we were started talking about the war. I mean, heck, there was nothing else to talk about in the defense and space talk, so I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, we started, and the man was literally shaking. And, and he started saying things, but the, uh, the Iraqis didn't know how to use our equipment. And I said, I think you're getting waxed is what's happening here. Um, I think the Iraqis were about as well trained as you trained them. Uh, what's happening here is, the stuff that Ogarkov wrote about is happening. The difference is, we did it. I mean, they, they, they got that. Then there were the two Chechen wars. Whatever you think about it, they don't think their performance was very good. I chose that picture of the helicopter. It's the largest Russian helicopter that was brought down. Uh, sort of just, there's a symbolic reason for it. You know, these little terrorists, these jihadis, whatever they are down there, uh, Chorny Wolosi, whatever you like. Uh, all of a sudden are bringing down this big 
bad Russian helicopter. They were shocked that these guys did what they did. Moreover, if you read what they wrote about it, they think they lost the information warfare in Chechnya. The Chechens understood how to use the internet. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that the Chechens, the Chechens had some great sophisticated approach to this, but the reality is they had websites. They understood how to get a press release out, out to the West. <coughs> they understood how to communicate with Western journalists. They did a pretty good job of telling their side of the story. Russians did not do a very good job of telling their side of the story, and they know it. Well, as you probably know, the Second Chechen War was instrumental in consolidating the power of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Probably would have been, without the Second Chechen War, a prime minister that some people who look closely at Russia remembered, who served just as Yeltsin left um, and was there for a year or two with the many people in the Russian political system. This is what consolidated his power. Why do I spend some time here on uh, Vladimir Putin? Because I think it's important, you're talking about a man who is likely going to be the leader of Russia for 25 years. And it's important to see what his mindset is. And his mindset is that 19th century geopolitical attitude that I talked about. The fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. That's his outlook. That's his view. This is also a guy who's very engaged in cyber. He started, as you're going to see in a moment, literally, as he took office, he made a speech. He said, we are vulnerable because we're buying foreign hardware. I'm trying to give you bookends here. Very soon, literally months after he took office, he's working the problem. We're buying foreign hardware, and that's a problem. That's got to change. Just a few months ago, he gave another speech. Oh, by the way, we're going to switch to Linux because we've got to get all our government stuff onto free software because if we keep doing what we're doing with all of the stuff that's basically brought to you by the Americans, we are vulnerable because of software. Now, a lot of stuff happened in the middle. I'm just trying to give you a beginning and an end. This is a guy who's engaged. Now, you could argue, and a lot of people do, is moving to Linux a smart move for them or a dumb move for them. You can, you can, but the point is the, the, the number one guy is involved in this debate. Um, so I think it's, it's very important, and it's also very important to remember, this is the Silovic in chief. This is the KGB guy. Make no mistake <coughs> who he is. So a decade of Vladimir Putin. We have a 1990s <coughs> law amended. The law on operational investigation gave the FSB uh, the power to monitor basically all communications. 2000 law says all the security services and oh, by the way, without any kind of a warrant, at least in the Yeltsin years. And come on, Yeltsin's Russia. I'm not saying it was all, everything was done right. But at least theoretically, it was only the FSB. And they had at least theoretically to go and get an order from a court uh, for, for electronic surveillance. No more. After 2000, any security service, and they don't need any documentation, any justification, or anything. Also, very soon after Putin took, um, took office, the uh, Doctrine on Information Security. Now, if you put your hand over the last two bullets and read that, you would say, well, you know, sounds pretty normal for most Western countries, right? I mean, you know, we have a doctrine. It's all written down. It says the state control information to protect strategically important information. You could find documents that say pretty much that in the United States, the United Kingdom, France. I mean, it's, it, that's not all that remarkable. Read the next two bullets. This is what makes Russia, Russia, okay? To protect against deleterious foreign information, and Kapuna's gonna get back to that in a moment. They're part of their international effort is very much to prevent them being infiltrated with evil information from the West. And more, not only to protect the great Narod from this outside information, but to inculcate in them the patriotic values that they want to, to inculcate. That is how they see information operation inside their own country. It's not just a protective thing. It's not just a thing that they use against other countries. It has everything to do with Russian internal politics. Well, I'm going to stop right there. Um, we're now going to get to sort of how do they do it. I'm going to turn over this gizmo to Katuna, and we'll see if she can figure out how to use it. Uh, and uh, she's going to see how to make it.
she, well, okay, you want me to stay in here and every time you, um, and I'll come back a little bit uh, and wind it up and then we'll turn it over to Michelle. So Khatuna is going to uh, start with a little bit about the organization of the Russian Federation for uh, cyber operations. You push that one I know. to the right. Okay. Um, I hope to be as good as David is. So you see what's happened. <laughs> Great, you're already dropping. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, let me speak about um, about FAPSI, about when uh, this organization uh, operated from 1991 to 2003. So main function of the FAPSI was the special communication, cryptography, um, code tracking, technical intelligence, counterintelligence, telecommunication, security, uh, information uh, security. Uh, <coughs> so um, after um, then uh, David mentioned then the Putin came into power. Uh, what's happened that uh, new um, information security doctrine was adopted. Uh, uh, he made a speech uh, about the vulnerability of foreign um, uh, software um, and hardware def dependence. And uh, there was a, in 2003, there was a FAPSI organization. So what's happened? So main function of uh, FAPSI, um, main function of the FAPSI um, uh, developed in SDR, Foreign Intelligence Service, GRU, Military Intelligence, FSO, Federal Protective Service, MVD, Interior Ministry, and FSB, Federal Security Service, successor of the KGB. So large portion of the FAPSI that was left after the reorganization was renamed as um, Special Communication and Information Service uh, and folded into the FSB. And, FS and also the FSB 16 Directorate uh, is um, believed to control Russian um, Russia's uh, hacker reserve force, uh, and many also believe that uh, in the southern city of Voronezh, <coughs> FSB uh, runs um, what is might the largest and one of the best hacker school in the world. So, and the uh, interior ministry, K, K department uh, uh, is responsible for routine internal communication and. Uh, um, and petty crime, uh, FSO, which also inherited some functions from um, FAPSI, monitors, telegraph, telephone, internet, satellite, uplinks and downlinks, and wireless communication. Also, FSO also has powers to conduct uh, searches and surveillance without um, any warrant uh, to make arrests and give orders uh, to other uh, state agencies. Um, also, given the um, uh, Russian nexus um, of government uh, crime and business, we must include the prior state organization like uh, uh, Russian Business Network and NASHI. Let me say a couple of words about NASHI. NASHI is a youth group that is funded by the by Kremlin, and the Russian uh, Business Network is a um, cyber uh, organized um, group that uh, that uh, was the key player uh, in 2008 attack against Georgia. Uh, also, um, um, and the Russian Business Network uh, evaporated uh, from the internet from 2000, uh, after 2008, or at least the invisible uh, cyber crim criminal groups that is uh, known to be a very to have a very close uh, tie with Putin um, a circle, in Putin circle. So. Um, also, government relationship with groups like RBN and Nasha believes to control by the FSB uh, 15 directorate. So, I should um, I should uh, also add that there also has been uh, a lot of talks uh, about the new cyber core uh, within the Russian army, perhaps part of the technical troops. Needless to say, that FSB has been enthusiastic <laughs> about. Uh, about this prospect. Um, so internet monitoring. So what's going on about this? Since 1998, FSB monitors internet with a uh, certain tool. This is the system of operation research measures. Um, uh, before it was a SORM one that, that was operated from 1996 to 1998. Uh, and then from 1992, so now um, the major, um, in all the information uh, packets copied uh, uh, for the SORM system and sent, uh, sent to FSB. So uh, internet service providers required to install it uh, 
any expenses uh, sort of to and uh, also required to train FSB uh, FSB officers um, to operate. So, so um, uh, benefits of subcontracted uh, sub subcontracting to criminals and youth group. Super cost effective confined attribution. This is the way how Russia sees it. Why I say this, why super cost effective? Because the state does not have to buy equipment, recruit, train personnel, and sustain personnel. The people and equipment are engaged in some other profitable activities when they are were not needed by the government. So further confuses attribution. Although the common sense and analysis one can eventually uh, make attribution, relevant time attribution um, uh, is still a challenge because using criminals um, and uh, kids uh, adds another layer of analysis and another note of doubts about who the ultimate organizer was. Um, Russian business network, let me say if, uh, to add a uh, couple of words about uh, this organization. Uh, this uh, closely linked to S domain, decertified by ICANN in October 2008. Uh, I just mentioned it's evaporated or at least an invisible Russian um, <coughs> cyber criminal group, uh, known as being involved in, um, to be involved in phishing, marketing, and malicious code, distribution in our um, uh, uh, in our service attack, child pornography, and uh, principles have surfaced in similar activities in uh, Russia and Ukraine and China, so um, possibly they are, uh, they are doing quite, um, um, they are uh, dodgy activities um, in some other sort of the way. So uh, let me, mm, uh, plenty of talents. So in, uh, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, Many uh, Russian scientists and mathematicians moved into the commercial world, which includes legitimate business and also cybercrime records and clandestine services for the government. So, um, you know, there are many universities that are known for high education standards in the field of math, physics, and uh, natural science. Oh. So, when the law is on your side, why I say this, that um, uh, there are, for example, uh, the government, in, uh, high official, uh, in Russian government, openly uh, praised the hackers for their criminal activities. For example, uh, in 2006, Deputy uh, Duma Deputy Nikolai Kurianovich wrote a letter congratulating hackers on an attack against uh, Israeli websites. And there are. Uh, um, uh, publications like uh, Hacker, um, uh, Computer Hooligan Magazine, those kind of publications thrive in, in uh, Russia, but publication, something like Nova Gazeta, opposition newspaper, uh, is harassed. Uh, and when you are on the wrong side of the law, so in April 6, in 2011, St. Petersburg Zenit football team uh, website was defaced. Uh, and um, then uh, fans was checking the uh, website of Russian champion football team. Um, so they saw, uh, the, uh, uh, they saw the political um, uh, message against the St. Petersburg governor and some other things. <coughs> so what's happened? Uh, and the, the car department was so effective that within the one day they detained and prosecuted this guy under the uh, criminal code article uh, to 172. Uh, here is the uh, picture of the Pavel Rublovsky, who is the principal of RX, who was the principal of RX promotion and uh, who was uh, recently arrested in Russia. Uh, no, because of his criminal activities, um, uh, his uh, pharmacy scam, but because he ran a fall uh, of more powerful Russian vested interests, a former partner paid to, to, uh, uh, to uh, um, have arrest, uh, him arrested or uh, both, I mean, who knows. But allegedly, uh, he um, hired um, 
harder to attack uh, competi uh, competitor uh, company assist uh, that she was in a competition for the uh, aeroflot business. Um, and here is um, a tech on our go uh, very uh, quickly about the 2007 attack on Estonia. Um, it, um, the attack um, was in two phases, when the uh, first of April 27, uh, to May 3, this is the first phase of the attack. Uh, it was less sophisticated, and then there was a uh, massive attack on, um, started May uh, 8, 9. So uh, there were a lot of, many uh, bot botnets involved in this attack, and more than million computers. So target uh, websites uh, were government, banks, uh, news organization, telephone exchange, and many, many websites of the uh, organization in Estonia. So let me uh, say a couple of words about what's happened in Georgia in 2008. In the beginning, there was the July, before the war, uh, early defacement. Uh, then uh, there was a DDoS attack, internet blockade, well-organized hacktivism, <coughs> fake BBC and CNN report named AVX Trojan, uh, August 27 DDoS attack again. So Georgia was the only country who sustained combined kinetic and cyber attack. So here is the some illustration. You see the um, president website was the face, uh, so depicting our president as a, um, a Hitler. So another one is the list of the targeted website and. Um, uh, and uh, also the um, a picture of the, um, the fake um, um, BBC and uh, uh, CNN report. If you clicked on this, you can dump the Trojan in your uh, computer. So um, uh, let me talk a little bit about the internal repression, what's going on uh, in this regard in Russia. So Russian uh, domestic opposition was a couple of months ago was a um, um, uh, recent uh, target of cyber attack. So the pre p uh, fingerprints of Russian organized <coughs> crime are also all over the DDoS um, attack on uh, Live Journal and the Novel Gazette. Live Journal is a blog site that is uh, famous uh, by its critiques of governments such as Alexei Navalny, anti-corruption crusader. Uh, and Novel Gazeta is the political um, opposition newspaper that mostly covers the social, uh, political, um, and economic affairs in Russia. So uh, uh, the uh, Nova Gazeta wanted to launch the um, online parliament on Brunet. So um, uh, the Russians, uh, the People's Freedom Party, one of the opposition party, um, whose head is a uh, uh, Nemtsov, Boris Nemtsov, they wanted to publish the new report about, about Putin and corruption and posted it in a um, live journal. And I mean, you see how, how this chronology, how um, they um, explain what kind of attacks happened. So March 24, there was a Navalny's blog site attack on live <coughs> journal. Another Navalny's blog site, Rospil in for April 4. Live journal was attacked April 7 and 8. Novi Gazette. And, and it's interesting that two uh, botnets uh, uh, were involved in this attack. and. Uh, uh, one darkness. So uh, Kaspersky Labs, uh, botnets uh, openly say that botnets associated with Russian organized crime, in particular, in particular darkness. And uh, now I would like to read you a couple quotes about the, uh, the Boris Nemtsov's quote about this attack. Hardly anyone could have done this other than the security security <coughs> services. Um, So um, it's also the several months ago there was a statement of the FSB cyber chief Andrei Chkin. Um, uh, he stated that um, uh, uncontrolled uses may lead to a massive threat to Russia's uh, security. So it's a, in, well, quite important what was the uh, continuation after the, his statement about this uh, about uh, the. Um, a guy uh, named Efim Bushmalov, an IT specialist from uh, Sirk Tivkar, uh, 
uh, he um, just claimed that uh, he figured out the source code of the Skype. And he was not prosecuted because of this, but he was hailed as a hero. And also, a few days later, Nikolai Priyanishniko, president of Microsoft Russia, said that he would like to hand the FSB Skype's cryptographic <coughs> algorithm. I would like to do it. The general approach of uh, Microsoft in Russia is a cooperation and partnership with the government. So uh, Microsoft claims that she was misunderstood, but make no mistake, mistake that Pianishnikov understands more about how to do business in Russia than they do uh, in Redma. So, um, Russia especially became concerned after the Arab Spring and London riots, and they're very concerned um, uh, about North Caucasus and upcoming Duma presidential election. And it's interesting what the, what the what, what Medvedev said um, uh, after after all of those events that um, after the Arab Spring and London riots. Look at the situation that um, has unfolded in the Middle East and the Arab world. It's extremely bad. There are major difficulties ahead. We need to look for the truth in their eyes. This is the kind of scenario that they were preparing for us, and now we will be bringing even harder to bring about. So it means that we are very concerned about this, and we are very concerned about social, social media. Uh, so from the Georgia's perspective, of course, we are concerned about another combined attack. Uh, but we must also should not dismiss the possibility of cyber attack. We must assume that such a campaign would um, feature improved techniques both uh, technically and sociologically uh, based upon to, on lessons learned and um, uh, from uh, in, in uh, 2008 and from the from around the world since then. And uh, from the uh, from the operation since the Israeli operation in Kesley in 2008 and 2009, and subsequent event in the Middle East, uh, we must assume that we will be a massive uh, use of social network sites by multiple sites. Um, we, uh, international approaches, I think that we shouldn't be beguiled about the new norms of cybersecurity because. Um, like, for example, they just recently UNGA Russia proposed its um, uh, agreement about uh, uh, code of conduct on information security, or at Munich Security Conference, there was another uh, sort of the proposal, Geneva Cyber Convention. That is not going to work because country like La Russia um, is in nexus, uh, in cahoot of organized crime, and uh, uh, rather than to prosecute them, I mean they they are uh, they are they are um, having a cooperation with them. So the only effective document is the European Convention on Cybercrime that, that is open uh, for signatures since 2001, and Russia is not joining this because that there is simple reason because it requires cross-border law enforcement cooperation. So. Um, this is uh, all what I wanted to say. I think that I will give a, uh, I hope that I gave a, a good analysis about how, how Russia sees its uh, cyber policy and how dangerous it could be, not only for the, for the small country like uh, Georgia, Estonia, but also complex country, uh, a big country uh, as the United States. So I think, I mean, hope you get Fatuna, thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation and very well delivered. Fatuna, um, by the way, operating in her third language, so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm struggling with my first. So um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, we didn't talk too much about the, the sort of the technical capabilities. There's people um, around town and even in this room far more qualified than we to talk about specific. But I think it's important just to say, I mean, obviously, uh, what General Burgess said uh, yesterday uh, in general applies to cyber. I wouldn't take Russia off the list. Uh, there is another well-known analyst of this sort of thing who says, yeah, you hear about China all the time because they get caught doing it. 
what you don't know is really dangerous, the, the risk of sounding like Don Rumsfeld. It's the unknown unknowns that you're, that you, that you're afraid of. Um, but clearly, we have uh, botnet capability, major botnet capabilities for various purposes, storing information, DDoS attacks, spying, whatever you want. Uh, counterfeit software, jamming surveillance of various forms, viruses, worms, logic bombs, it's all there. Advanced exploitation capabilities. I mean, these guys are in this game, and I think we need to pay serious attention. Let me just conclude with a couple of just sort of summary and conclusions. Um, I unfortunately or fortunately did learn public speaking first in the United States Air Force, where I was taught you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Here's what we told you. Um, <laughs> First of all, the Russian cyber threat is serious. Uh, there is this unique nexus of government, business, and crime. And I think if you take nothing away from what uh, else other than what we, uh, what we said today, that is really important. I don't know how many times I've heard American law enforcement officials talking about our counterparts in the FSB. You don't have counterparts in the FSB. You're talking to the brother of the guy who done it. Okay? I mean, it's really important to understand what's going on here. They have a very comprehensive view of information warfare, uh, and they certainly see it as part of warfare, and warfare takes, takes place 365 days a year. It takes place down the street in Moscow. It takes place against neighbors like Georgia and Estonia. And make no mistake, folks, it takes place against the United States of America. Uh, Putin is a key player. Um, this is an issue that is clearly on his agenda. Remember who he is. Gorbachev pulled all this stuff out of the then KGB and created what became FOPSI. That's sort of what happened throughout the Yeltsin years. And what did Putin do? He stuffed most of it right back in the FSB. He is totally engaged in this. We have the integral use of youth groups and criminal groups. You should assume uh, monitoring those of you who do travel to Russia uh, if you're taking electronic devices, you should assume, particularly with the kind of people you are in this room, you should assume they are listening, reading, uh, watching what you're doing. Um, they are working the technical aspects clearly, but I think Hatuna brought out a very interesting point there at the end. They are very carefully considering social media, the sociological aspects of this, and the uses of it. There is an international dimension. Remember that holistic view of information warfare. Their proposals in the international arena are part of their information warfare against the West. And I think the word you used was beguile. That is exactly what they are trying to do, to beguile the West into agreeing to a bunch of measures which will stymie anything we're trying to do, and they will proceed, I assure you, to do whatever they please. Uh, we have elections coming up in just a few weeks. Stay tuned, because you're going to see some really interesting things from Russia in the cyber field. With that, I would like to uh, ask uh, my old, or is it long-standing friend, Michelle Markoff, oh, to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the long, long sitting at this point. Um, do, you, do you want to run the microphone, too? Sure. You're no, is it important for what you're doing? Oh. Either way, whatever you're more comfortable with. Okay. Whatever you're more comfortable doing, apparently. Um, <laughs> well, if everybody can hear me, I think we'll sit right here. So, um, maybe rather than repeating things that uh, uh, Dave and Katuna have said, I would actually like to elaborate and provide my value added with respect to the international dimension, which you raised, but I actually live in. Uh, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis and have for over a decade as the, uh, shall we say, the pointy end of the diplomatic sphere. So um, how does what uh, Dave and Hatuna said extend itself into the international dimension as policy? What, what is Russia's external policy posture and what are they actually seeking to do? And you've had uh, some, some intimation of this. So, um, uh, consistent with what Dave said about the early recognition of information operations as a potential uh, area of military uh, activity, so too did uh, the Russian MFA and with a lot of support from what became the FSB uh, in 1997-98 
recognized so thoroughly that they were probably not um, equal to the task of, of competing with the U.S. that they proposed in the United Nations First Committee, which is the Military and Arms Control Committee, a resolution uh, drawing attention to what they call information security. Uh, so let me be very clear what that means. We talk about cybersecurity, and by cybersecurity we talk about networks, systems, and the data, content neutral, that resides on those systems when we talk about securing them or doing things with them. That's when we talk about cyber. Um, Russia talks about content, China too. So information security includes the systems and the networks and also the character of the information that is coming across the networks. That is, um, its ability to be politically uh, destabilized. Uh, and I would probably note that this is like, what Dave's tried to say, not a lot has changed from uh, earlier times. Uh, Russia has always been concerned about uh, what type of information was um, given to their population. Certainly that was true during the Cold War. That's why we had Voice of America uh, and other types of activities to try to give people the truth because, in fact, information uh, was controlled and there's still an inclination to control it. So we're talking about information security. So the terms of this resolution in the first committee uh, was essentially uh, an arms control ban on what they called information weapons. Again, not simply tools of warfare, but tools of mass propaganda. And um, we managed to water down the resolution, and that, that in it of itself has a long history. But suffice to say that the distilled essence of the Russian proposals include what they call a triad. So that there was arms control or an attempt, the initial attempt was a ban on the development, deployment, and use by states of information weapons. The second piece call, talks about information terrorism. So information terrorism is a euphemism for uh, banning uh, politically undesirable speech. So the Uyghurs would be information terrorists and the Chechens are information terrorists. Um, that notion of information terrorism um, had associated with it a larger uh, uh, proposal or construct. And that construct was one of establishing uh, national sovereignty over cyberspace. So what they uh, have proposed then and proposed with greater robustness now is a notion that states, just as they have sovereignty over the physical borders, have sovereignty over their borders and cyberspace so as to control the ingress and egress of information. And uh, most recently this summer, they proposed to us, um, they and the Chinese, although in separate contexts, that in fact the notion of sovereignty in cyberspace be viewed as analogous to sovereignty over territorial seas and airspace. They, thus, they don't own it, but they can regulate it nonetheless. <coughs> and so uh, that was the second piece. And then the third piece was they don't like the uh, 2001 Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. Uh, they say it's because of something called Article 32B, which would allow, with the assent of a victim, uh, cross-border um, exploring in, in servers in another territory for, to investigate a crime. Uh, but um, I suspect uh, from long hearing about this that that's not the only thing. And I, and I would say I'm not so quite so convinced of the competence of the FSB and others. I think that Russia cannot enforce uh, or does not care to enforce uh, whatever cybercrime law that in fact it has uh, and therefore would not be able to actually cooperate um, uh, on key issues. In fact, there is some law enforcement cooperation on cybercrime, but uh, as, as I said, we speak a different language. They're interested in taking down websites, sites of information terrorists, and we'd actually like to um, catch people who actually do real criminal acts. Um, 
so that, that triad constitutes the essence of the Russian proposal. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, we did not bite for over 10 years. We kind of just said no. Um, however, in 2010, uh, we tried to change the terms of this discussion uh, about these proposals in the context of the United Nations group of governmental experts pursuant to this long-standing Russian resolution. So uh, with Russia as, as the chair, uh, 14 other states came together for a year of meetings uh, to see whether there was something that, uh, some consensus that we could arrive at and say something about this area in this political military sphere. Um, and what the U.S. did at that point was say, uh, was to affirm openly uh, but internationally for the first time, uh, its belief that the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law applies to cyberspace as it does to kinetic uh, activities. And that, um, uh, and that treating it as such would allow us to say that attacks on critical information infrastructures uh, and, and other types of civilian based infrastructures that had no military merit uh, should not be targeted. Um, we also said that we need to put more thought into how uh, norms such as proportionality, distinction, other elements of IHL would apply because distinction when it comes to cyberspace can be a tricky issue. So um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, 14 out of the 15 states participating, and these included what I would call uh, the major cyber powers with a couple of hangers on. So you had the US, UK, France, Germany, Estonia, Israel, Italy, Russia, China, India, Brazil, and then Belarus, South Africa, and Qatar. Um, so with the exception of China, even Russia was willing, in the first instance, to affirm the applicability of the law of armed conflict. Um, China was kind of asleep in the back row for the first half year, and uh, woke up on the third negotiating round and brought it somebody actually who understood what was going on and said no, and tried to gut the report that was fast uh, rolling in the direction of, of consummation. Um, but in the final analysis, um, where we did arrive was at a very modest consensus report among all 15 states uh, that talked about the need to develop uh, norms, norms of behavior in cyberspace uh, that would reduce the prospect that misperception due to the lack of attribution uh, in, in cyberspace would lead to conflict inadvertently. And secondly, that we ought to develop confidence building measures that would also reduce that risk. Um, uh, Russia was willing to go along uh, initially with the US position because uh, I, don't, I think they do believe that the law of armed conflict um, applies. Um, they, however, they, don't, they have always indicated that it's not sufficient. Um, China, however, has made clear, particularly clear this summer, although they didn't articulate it well in 2010, that they don't believe that any existing international law uh, currently applies to cyberspace. Well, that position is interesting, of course, because that uh, allowed uh, this new document that was just tabled on September 12th in the 66th UNGA, kind of in a, with a, a, f a formal but indeterminate status, and this is called uh, a code of conduct in information security. So this was actually uh, a product of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization again, and um, but it was proposed in, by China in conjunction with Russia, uh, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Um, not all of the SEO states signed up to this. So what this new code of conduct does, and the Chinese call it the five principles, is really recycle uh, old kind of Cold War con concepts. 
So there's a non-interference in internal affairs concept. There is a, a sovereignty concept. There is a non-proliferation concept, which would in fact affect the dissemination of all information technology, quintessentially a dual-use technology. Um, there is a, it's a statist document, which in fact subjects uh, all, everything, uh, all internet governance issues, that is, who controls the DNS servers, uh, as well as um, uh, speech to government regulation control on a national sovereign basis. So all in all, it's a pretty retrograde document. Um, so that's where we stand actually right now. Um, interestingly enough, it was not the U.S. Uh, that had a particular opportunity, although we have told them and told the rest of the First Committee of the UN that we uh, were, not, uh, were not impressed by this document, that um, it was actually NGOs who have written to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, some 16 of them, complaining about the suppression of freedom of expression, internet freedom here. and. Um, when this Russian resolution, this one that's been around for 13 years, which is pretty, in its, in its actual text, quite innocuous now since we've, since we've watered it down over the course of 13 years. Um, when it came up for um, a, a consensus renewal uh, without an individual vote, uh, the Baltic and um, Nordic states uh, Although they voted with consensus, they gave an explanation of vote which excoriated the document on the basis of its uh, suppression of internet freedom. So my feeling is that um, this document will ha be battered and bruised by the time it gets uh, around to the repository that it's intended for, which is next year in August of 2012, we will have yet another group of governmental experts to continue our work of 2010. And it's there that that document will be proposed as, a, as either a terms of reference or a contribution for, for that dialogue. Anyway, I'll stop there uh, since it kind of ends nicely. <laughs> Oh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think General Reist had was called to another meeting, so I think that leaves me as also the chair of, of the meeting. But uh, as he did say, uh, now it's over to you uh, for uh, whatever comments and uh, questions you may have. If you um, uh, do make a comment, uh, please try and keep it fairly brief so everybody has a chance. And could you let us know uh, who you are and uh, where you are? Uh, when you when you speak for the first time. Also, before I forget, I just want to let you know we have some little propaganda packets here uh, in our in our own little information warfare, which are some of Kuna's articles and some of my articles uh, in a card. I don't think we have enough for everybody, but please take them. It's really really painful for an author to find their papers still sitting there when uh, you know, there's trash cans downstairs. You can, you know, you can get, but, but don't hurt our feelings, okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, Tyler Cohen, uh, DOD, I have a question. Is there any evidence that there's been uh, Chinese and Russian collaboration on cyber capabilities? Well, uh, open Anything sources. Talk about. Yeah, I mean, uh, no. Uh, well, well, she and I don't have, I mean, we're, 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 everything we do is open source. Obviously, there are other people in the room who, who have access to other information, probably including yourself. Uh, but, uh, um, I certainly, I, you hear this. Uh, it seems to me that there, as uh, Michelle Markoff just detailed, there is a certain level of maybe tense, but nonetheless political level uh, cooperation on uh, this sort of thing. And we keep hearing that some of the principles of some of the Russian organized crime networks, like Russian business network, have turned up in China and are thriving in China. I think I once made the comment in a presentation, if I know they're there, I guess the Chinese know they're there too. And uh, so they must, you know, there's obviously some level of tolerance. Uh, whether there's actually sort of government to government uh, collusion, I, I just don't know. I haven't seen anything in the open literature. My guess tells me at some low level, yes, but I don't know. Yeah, and also that Michelle Markov mentioned, there is a potential high 
rational organization, they have the agreement about the, some of the information terrorists take, <laughs> take the um, um, uh, website uh, uh, that is not acceptable uh, for their government. So in this area, they, they have their cooperation. So other than that, probably the dimensions on the law level probably they are not Remember, you're, you're, you're dealing with countries that are suspicious of each other, too. I mean, yeah. you know, they may be more like each other than they are like us, but they you know, have a choice. You know, I certainly couldn't comment on whether they share technical capabilities, but certainly, uh, openly, in the UNGGE, uh, Russian proposals included language on issues that the Russians don't care about. Uh, that was quintessentially Chinese language, the language they use in the UN constantly about uh, peculiar cultural circumstances, which uh, are, is usually used to excuse them from observing human rights standards and things like that. That found its way into Russian proposals, which uh, I hadn't ever seen before. And I think that, that certainly um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has become kind of the petri dish for um, thinking up some of these things. And one of the reasons why they use the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is because it ranks formally as a regional organization, which means that the documents it produces have some status as customary international law and can be referred to in UN and other documents. And that's one of the reasons why they use it. The Warsaw Pact is dead, so they don't have another option. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Sean Sullivan, Asymmetric Corporation. Thinking about the overlap of criminal activity with cyber, with other activities, and the moment focusing upon Russia. Besides capitalizing upon their ability to co opt cyber capabilities within student organizations and organized crime, is there any evidence, any suggestion of Financing of government cyber capabilities development through taxation on tolerating cyber crime. Sean, let me make sure I understand what you're asking. Um, you're asking if there is government, basically government investment in cyber crime? No. Or are you asking the opposite? Is there criminal yeah. investment in the, government the cyber? state security apparatus in its various mm -hmm. incarnations, which is aware of cyber financial crime by criminal organizations within Russia, in addition to selectively capitalizing on that capability to launch deniable campaigns, is taxing those cyber, financial, criminal organization <coughs> as a fee uh, for allowing them to continue to operate and is ingesting that fee into the support for their governmental operations. Do they benefit? You're talking about taxation. Okay. <laughs> Extortion. Well, Extortion. There's, tax okay. there's taxation and there's taxation. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> If you're talking about sort of officially, I have not seen anything where, you know, there's sort of a, an 8% fee levied as the, you know, the government cyber development fee for uh, Rx Pharmacy to, uh, to operate. There is a great deal of evidence that there is an incredible amount of, shall we say, taxation, otherwise known as bribes, uh, paid back to uh, members of the Russian state. I'm not aware of anything going into the coffers of the Russian state. It usually works the other way. Things come out of the coffers of the Russian state and into someone else's pocket. Go and ask Sergei Magnitsky if you can find him. Michelle, doesn't that mean? First here and then here. Sure. Eric, you mean American? Oh, sorry. Oh, you project so we can um, hear you. I'm Eric Louie at American University, and I was wondering, um, given the fundamental differences of opinions that we have with norms and the roles of sticking one's internal attack dog, um, overused metaphor, the differences of opinion that we have with Russia and China, what are 
what really are the prospects for building effective international institutions, whether in the forms of laws or norms, um, on on creating a better cyberspace for um, for companies in particular? Um, I'm not sure that we're so interested in building institutions so much, but certainly we are in the process of developing a framework of norms of behavior. Uh, but we view those norms of behavior as rooted in existing international law for the most part. Uh, I think the first step in the development of any normative process is to find like-minded states who uh, share the same type of values that we do. The payoff, of course, is a more quiescent, internationally stable uh, internet or cyberspace environment where everybody is able to reap economic and other types of social benefit. And if that's the payoff, then the reason why we would coalesce together is to behave in appropriate reasons in order to maintain that. So I think that uh, in some senses, that is probably, at least at the top level, a shared goal. That all countries, whether it's Russia, China, or the rest of us actually uh, see great economic benefit coming from information technology. Um, at the same time, um, uh, you know, we may not, just as we didn't in the past, get affirmations of closely held values, but we were able to find areas of common ground where we could work together practically on measures that could Mm -hmm. depending upon the issue area, area, decrease the threat of conflict, uh, uh, increase um, trade, decrease threats to supply chain security, and all of that. So one might imagine establishing norms. Of course, there will always be those who do not want to comply, whether they be non-state actors or even state actors. But having a coalition, a large coalition of like-minded states, mean you do to them what you do in the physical world. You sanction them, you isolate them, uh, you cut them off, you do things that you might need to do there as well. So um, we, we need to push ahead regardless, because we need to have a conversation even among <coughs> ourselves uh, with shared values about how we're going to make all of this work. Um, thank you. Joanne Jones, former USAID consultant, concerned citizen at this point. Question if you could address a bit whether we've reached a point of mutually assured destruction standoff regarding strategic infrastructure, our concerns about our electric grid and other infrastructure, and I'm sure the Georgia, Estonia, others have been obviously quite worried about what further consequences could come from cyber warfare. So that question. And then it's probably for another seminar, but the issue of preventative measures on the part of countries likely to be victims of these kinds of attacks. I'm not sure any of you want to talk to that one, but I think it is a major concern that our infrastructure, we're incredibly naive about whether this, what I would call mutually assured destruction threat or standoff will hold us through uh, some of the bad repercussions that could come from cyber warfare on our infrastructure. Um, um. I will say, um, first of all, Georgia, I mean, uh, we, I just mentioned that we are very concerned about the uh, possible kinetic attack, but we're also very concerned about the um, cyber attack as well. But what we've done after the 2008, that um, we uh, created the data exchange agents that are dealing with this issue, uh, that is responsible for the uh, CERC, emergency response team. Um, we should understand that we are uh, having a very lack of resources in terms of the financial resources and human resources. We are having a, several people who are dealing with, with, with these issues in a cert, but it's not enough. Also, what about the uh, critical infrastructure? What we are do, doing that the, we are the, um, defining the critical infrastructure, first of all. And we are um, crafting the legislation in this regard, so what kind of uh, uh, cooperation between the government and the private sector should be, because mostly the, the um, critical infrastructure is owned by the um, private sector, mainly. 
so uh, this is the very important issue. So um, what we, I mean, uh, uh, we are doing, I mean, this is the, of all of these things, and we are very concerned, of course, because if, for example, the, uh, we will be the attack on electric grid, on water supply system, and what we're going to do, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, lot of challenges ahead of us in, in, this, in this regard. So, so far, I mean, uh, we'll reach it, something, but I mean, we are aware we, uh, we still have to work with this. And with like mind, we are very engaged in a cooperation with like minded countries. Uh, we, we had a cooperation with Estonians, with, uh, um, uh, with the United States, with some other countries to help us sort of the, how we have to deal with this very important issue. If, for example, uh, financial system will be shut down and uh, uh, water supply system, electric grid, I mean, once again, it, this will uh, bring down country. So, this is... Michelle. So, um, I could answer your question on a lot of different levels. So, does MAD apply in cyberspace? Mm -hmm. No, not really. Uh, because uh, you don't have the conditions. Uh, MAD really depends on a deterrent relationship. Um, and a classical deterrent relationship means you need to know who's attacking you, and you have to have the ability to hold them hostage. And so the answer is there's thousands of perpetrators out there. There are probably only a very few that have uh, the capability of doing a lot of damage uh, to us nationally, a very few. Uh, and it's not even clear that that would particularly be at this point widespread damage in mind. Uh, estimation. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, while deterrence perhaps with a big D doesn't work, that uh, deterrence with a little D can work, which means that you need to have a lot of uh, mutually reinforcing and overlapping strategies which kind of build your walls up. First you got to lock your doors. That takes out a lot of the riffraff. Uh, then you have you really have to decide who is it that you want to deter. Uh, and there's probably only uh, a few states who would threaten, who could possibly threaten us nationally. And lucky enough, those are the states that we've learned to signal over the last 50 years. So what we need to do is refine our other strategies, such as declaratory policy, posture, all of which, in fact, are invisible. Um, so there's a challenge, obviously, in this, but there's a lot of people talking about it. The uh, Defense Department has its unclassified uh, defense strategy for operating in cyberspace. All of these are little bricks in that wall which begin to um, uh, build a little bit of deterrence. I would just like to say one word, uh, well, a few words, um, about that. I, you know, I was never a fan of MAD throughout the years during which it uh, supposedly worked. All we know is it didn't fail. Uh, but even in the, what, what Michelle called the classical deterrence uh, uh, model, it's not altogether clear that, that that's exactly what, what happened. Uh, I would be very skeptical of a uh, situation in which you've got multiple actors, uh, some of which may or may not be nation states. Uh, some of them clearly are, but some of them may not be. Um, where you've got, even within the nation state, I mean, look what I just described with Russia. I think Russia coordinated those uh, attacks on Georgia and Estonia. But it's certainly not the classical model. I mean, you've got a lot of actors, and do you have control? Yes. Do you have total control? Probably not. You know, you don't, I mean, so it's a slightly different uh, situation. They should be held accountable for that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I, it's not the old you know, uh, we have the release codes, we've got, you know, the, 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 the naval officer carrying the football behind the president, Those, that, that's not happening. Um, and um, the, the other thing it has, is, you know, we're, we're not in a situation with nuclear weapons, complicated as they were, they're pretty simple. You know, they were these things and they went boom. Um, you know, a little, a little more complicated than that, but, um, you know, I mean, you sort of understood what they did. They came over here, they went boom, and they destroyed something. Uh, how do you, you, you even know? I mean, who knows talking about you know, the electrical grid goes down, the, uh, the ATMs go down, the air traffic control system goes down. Um, 
that might be one attack. Another attack could be a different sort of thing. Uh, you know, you've got something like Stuxnet. Uh, all of a sudden, something happened. I'm not sure anybody's really still sure what. Maybe in you know, maybe in some of the classified community there is, but I'm not real sure on that stuff I've read that we really do understand fully what Stuxnet did and was intended to do and actually achieved. So I, I, I would be very worried about this. It seems to about some kind of notion of deterrence. Uh, it seems to me that's a recipe for sitting there fat, dumb, and happy and then, and then being very, very uh, rudely awakened one day. Uh, Dr. Stonebrunner had a question, then the gentleman over here. Gary Stonebrunner, John Thompson University Applied Physics Laboratory. Well, it wasn't my original question, but just, it feeds off of this. Um, what, you said that the Russians have been studying cyber they know. Um, what do we know about what they know with regard to the topic we've just been talking about? Have they driven? any indication where their lines in the sand are? You go far enough, they said, we reserve the right yep. to make a nuclear response. Have they drawn any lines in this? Have we inferred any? I know we're being close hold about that for a number of reasons. How about them? Well, of course, when you say, have, have we inferred any, I, I don't know who we is. We is, we, you know, if you're well, asking me, it's only me. I certainly can't speak for the United States government or any other government about, uh, about you know, what we are inferring. Um, it seems to me, I mean, you know, Russians make a lot of noise. You, you've got to remember that. They're very, very worried. As I said in my presentation, I think Michelle followed up. Uh, they are very worried about uh, information coming into the North Caucasus from various, from Wahhabis, as they call it. Everybody is a Wahhabi, that, you know, that is vaguely Muslim and against the Russians. Uh, so you have, to, you have to use the you have to use the term advisedly. Uh, they also call everybody Arabs, you know. But I mean, so it's but 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 you know those guys. Uh, you know they're very worried they're about that kind of. They're afraid of their own youth. They're I'm sorry. They're afraid of their own Arab Spring. They're afraid of their own Arab Spring. Their own people. Um, they're f terribly frightened of people like Navalny uh, doing this kind of damage. Now the problem with Navalny is how do you retaliate? I mean, you know. You can go beat him up. You can kill him like they did with Anna Politkovskaya. Uh, you can disable his computers. You can take, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do to him, but it's not, you know, that line in the sand that you're talking about. I haven't really seen any specific discussion of exactly where the line is. Um, but as you say, that's also the case in the United States. And if I were trying to deter someone, um, I said this a couple of days ago, and it was printed in Reuters, so it must be true. Um, you, you know, you, you, you need to, there's a skill to saying, I will do things, and I have the capability and the will, but you also don't want to create an automaticity that you may regret. And uh, the Russians, if nothing else, are skilled in the practice of mutual assured destruction and deterrence, and my guess is that's what they're doing, too. Um, this gentleman here. Uh, yeah, my name is Tim Dempster. I'm representing the Terrorism and Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at George Mason School of Foreign Policy. And uh, my question is, uh, you had talked about the kind of, uh, these interlocking, interlocking uh, you know, communities of business and government and, uh, and organized crime groups. And I was wondering um, with, if, if, in fact, the, the, the Russian government is kind of contracting out to organized crime groups to conduct these kind of operations. Um, to what degree do we know if there's, you know, if they're basically funding and this? Maybe this kind of goes to the question that was asked earlier. What degree are they enacting a kind of technology transfer from, you know, state-developed resources to, you know, these transnational criminal groups, potentially transnational criminal groups, to facilitate, uh, you know, crime, uh, financial crimes, money laundering, uh, you know, you name it. Um, so. And my other question actually was in, in involving this informational warfare, this kind of came to me, but I was wondering whether you could comment at all on their English language uh, news service, the Russia Today, and how that plays a role in their own kind of informational warfare. Is that, is that? Uh, okay, just, uh, I would say for the we have to we have to acknowledge who is the uh, who uh, uh, is the principal of the LPN. The guy who was the former FSB officer. Mm -hmm. So uh, how we operate that uh, they uh, that people and equipment are engaged in to do some other profitable activities until they're moving by the government. 
So uh, they say that you can do whatever you, whatever you want, uh, but if I need you, if you uh, if you are needed by the motherland, you should come here and you should help me. So this is the this is the sort of the message. This is the thing how they talk to you. They're about the national national. And you don't family. attack me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and what about Nashi? Nashi is a youth group that is funded by the Kremlin. So uh, now uh, they have uh, been engaged in a straight polygamy uh, activities and now they are in a cyber polygamy activities. So uh, this is the uh, this is how I mean they're they're in Kahoot. They're all of this business crime, government, I mean because they're so uh, close uh, uh, putting in a, a circle that is that this is the real life, you can do whatever you want, but it's more I need you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can come here and do without any kind of payment because you already are, you have green light and you're a criminal. Mm -hmm. So what, this is the way how we see this, how they operate. I think now for a follow-up so, question, is, to what degree does that, do you think that that kind of relationship uh, creates the stability within the Russian structure? If there's no honor among thieves, like what, you know, how do, I mean for them it's a major risk, don't you think, that they're still in, yeah, I would say that there's no honor among thieves is a very American concept. <laughs> I think there's a great deal of honor among thieves. Um, no, I mean, I'm serious. In, in, in many cultures, uh, you know, there are thieves, there's honorable thieving and there's dishonorable thieving, and there's things you do and there's things that you don't do. The fact that they may be illegal, that we may look at them and say that's a very, very, very bad thing. Uh, just the example Khatuna gave about the poor guy, he ran a sporty goods store, by the way. Uh, and if you read what he wrote about uh, the woman who is the governor of, of St. Petersburg region, uh, she's a Putin crony, and the other guy that was on that picture is a, I think he's the, uh, the chairman of the, uh, of the St. Petersburg said, so, yeah. Um, and uh, my guess is the charges that the guy put down were probably pretty accurate. Um, look what happened to him. The law was enforced immediately. Okay, there's certain that inside that circle, there's things you do. I think I'm gonna just get one of the points. If I call you, and I need, you wanna sell fake Viagra to the Americans, you wanna say, you know, I'm stuck in London, send me $3,000, you wanna sell child pornography, you, you do that stuff. When I call you, uh, you're here. And what, was, what did Rubleski do, the other guy she showed, okay? He's running all this fake Viagra. He was, he was one of the top spammers in the world, RX Pharmacy, all of this stuff. What did he do? That's not why he was arrested. He was arrested because he hired a hacker to uh, attack a competitor who was involved with Aeroflot. Aeroflot is a public corporation, which, is, I mean, which equals basically corruption. He got in the way of somebody um, who wanted to, to do that. And so he's hauled away. And you can see this, it's not just on, on cyber. Uh, look at Sergei Magnitsky uh, talking about major, I mean, unbelievable. There's a video, by the way, about this. Um, unbelievable corruption in the tax service. I mean, literally billions just off into the hands of half a dozen people, including FSB officers. Um, what happened to him? He's dead. Uh, so, you know, I think there is a code of honor, and the code of honor is the honor of the chief. There's the big guy, his name is Vladimir Putin, and then here's the next concentric circle, and the next concentric circle, and then it's sort of like the mafia. And if you think there's no code of honor among the mafia, you're sad, sadly mistaken. There is. You violate the laws of the government, but believe me, there are certain things you do and certain things you don't do. And uh, if you think you can't be found dead on the Belt Parkway somewhere, uh, I assure you, you can be. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's, now there was the, the other question you asked, though, I think is really interesting. To what extent is there a technology thing going back and forth? I don't think we know if we include those of us who work in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the uh, above board world, uh, in, in, in the white world, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would suspect, first of all, let, let me make two comments. One, um, the kinds of stuff that those guys are doing is not cutting edge technology, okay? The attacks on Estonia went from phase one, which was pretty, you know, not very skillful, to phase two, which was more skillful. But for the guys who are technically savvy in the room about this stuff will tell you, okay, you know, but it, we're still not talking about cutting edge technology. We're talking about somebody sitting there going, this is working, that isn't working. When you went from uh, Estonia 
in 2007 to Georgia in 2008, there were again improvements. They went from SMTP to HTTP. They learned that, that how to take up more time on a server with a single query. Um, but we're still not talking about, this is not Stuxnet, okay? We're still not talking about really cutting edge stuff. So uh, the, the, the first answer to your question is, I'm not sure how much of really serious advanced technology those guys really need. What I would say is this, and I don't know this, I'm just supposing, just seeing how the system works. Anything that the Russians, uh, the official Russians, think they might want those guys to use, I would assume it is flowing that way. So if they've got plans that they're going to use this or that or the other thing against somebody someday, but they want the cutout where it's done by an organized crime, I assume that it's, it's flowed the other way, but I don't know that. Uh, okay, there was this gentleman. One and then two and then three. Uh, Richard Andrus from the National Board of College. I have a sort of a practical question. Uh, I'm really looking for a practical answer to this. So let me try to, to spell this out. In 2009, I ran an exercise for the White House looking at the vulnerability. Uh, I, I say in 2009, I, I ran an exercise for the White House looking at the vulnerability of critical infrastructure systems to cyber attacks. And we, we came away from that fairly optimistic. The idea was probably individuals could not do really sustained damage. Large organizations probably didn't have the capability to do extensive national level damage, but certainly countries had that capability and Russia absolutely was on the top of that list. But we figured we could deter countries, most likely. So we left that relatively optimistic. After Stuxnet, and uh, you'll, you'll notice that now, too, we're seeing the sons of Stuxnet coming out. We're seeing clones that are using the technology starting to surface. So, so those observations and that optimism is not necessarily appropriate anymore. I'm not sure. So my, my question is, though, how do, we, how do we get the Russians practically to make sure that those non-state organizations that we've just been talking about for the past 10 minutes don't start to use this military grade hardware against us. How do, because they've been empowering these guys, the Chinese too, but maybe they're not completely in control of them. They might be tempted to do some of the technology transfers we were talking about, or more, more likely just turn a blind eye or not crack down hard enough for other reasons. What are the practical ways that we can encourage the Russians to make sure that this sort of military-grade hardware does not fall into the hands of or is not used by non-state actors. What military-grade hardware? The sons of Stuxnet that are starting to emerge now. And for those of you that aren't, aren't aware of this, Stuxnet has often been described more as a missile system that can carry any warhead. So the theory is that it could be re-engineered in such a way as to take down different systems than um, hypothetically Iranian uh, nuclear refinement. And if we're, if we're starting to see some of the SCADA networks that have real interesting effects that might be coming from this type of military grade. Uh, well, I guess, it, I guess it depends on who you think controls Stuxnet, and I think the jury's still out on that. However, um, I would say that there's probably no easy fix to this. To the extent that you believe that there are state sponsors of non-state actors do undertaking um, uh, attacks on any other state from their territory, that is, in fact, uh, prohibited under international law, which you said, Bellum. And in fact, in our proposals in the UN, we would, in fact, we have, in fact, stated that state use either wittingly or unwittingly of proxies uh, to undertake attacks is a bad thing, although we are in the process of defining what we mean by bad thing. Um, so there are, all you can do uh, with respect to a state is, as I said, establish norms and try to get them uh, accepted. In fact, the Russians thought that outlawing proxies was a grand thing. And, uh, and that they would sign up to it immediately, and why hadn't they thought of that first? Um, how they that apply that um, on their own 
territory with respect to uh, RBN or uh, its, its successors uh, and others who might be doing things on their behalf? I don't know. Obviously, there's a lot of states who might rogue states who might do things uh, with plausible deni to try to maintain plausible deniability. So uh, I'm not sure that there's any practical measures. Yep. Terry Morgan with Global Thought. I work with uh, IT companies on the strategic perspective that swirl around global business. So my question of you, we heard one reference to one major IT company in, in Russia. And rather than have a long question, I'd ask for your comments about are these major global IT companies, let's say, wearing the white hats from the perspective of we're looking at dupes, collaborators, contributors to this problem? How is it impacting their business? Just your insights uh, from the, kind of the government status perspective into the business perspective of major global IT vendors. Well, I mean, I don't think any multinational corporation trying to do business around the world and in IT stuff is a do for a white hat or, or anything else. I think that uh, they pay attention to their bottom line and their shareholders as they should. Uh, the question is uh, if as a class of entities, multinational corporations uh, um, based in the U.S. are subject to major discrimination or stuff, repression, or whatever you want to call it, and I'm trying to be diplomatic, um, uh, they need to decide whether they need to make a stand. And in my experience thus far, there are very few who want to give up market share to make a stand. Google, Google being a notable exception, although new Google kind of went one step forward and two steps back on this stuff as well. Um, you know, certainly, you know, Russia is an issue, China is an issue. There's a lot of protectionism, there's a lot of um, uh, talk about taking things to the WTO and, and things like that, but I don't really consider, I, you know, it would be nice from a governmental point of view for them to stand up and say, you know, stop doing this to us. Uh, but standing up individually doesn't seem likely to happen. I, I would just offer you this. I mean, there's something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which so when we're talking about money, you know, uh, you want this contract, give me a bag of money under the table. That's illegal for an American company to participate in that. People have been prosecuted for that. Now, if you go out there, uh, you will find that that gives uh, other companies, and I'm not talking, I'm talking about Western companies here, a big advantage, because in certain cultures that is how business is done, and so it's it's it's, it's hard. Now, on that quote that Hakuna used about uh, Microsoft, I can't remember the gentleman's name, the head of uh, Microsoft in Russia, uh, when they were arguing over the source code for Skype. I mean, he said that was. I, I would argue that that was the the, the cyber equivalent of the bribe. Uh, they said to do business here, this is how it's done. And he said, I understand how business is done here, and we are anxious to cooperate with it. Now that's not illegal. Uh, it's a piece of property. Microsoft can give it away if they want to, uh, and we can have whatever opinion we want to have of that activity. But it's the kind of thing we need to think about. I don't think, I, I agree with Michelle, I don't think they're dupes, I don't think they're collaborators, I don't think they're contributors. I think the problem is they're in business to make money. And absent a legal structure that says everybody can't do that, at least in America, no company can pay a bribe. Now, that doesn't apply to French companies or Italian companies or whatever, but at least on the American playing field, it's leveled. You can't, you can't do that. Uh, until you start doing that, there's going to be a big temptation to play ball. I think what Google ran into is it at first played ball, found out it was that it was going to get worse and worse and worse. As the police will tell you, when you start paying ransom, uh, you better be careful where this ends. Um, and then they then they went public, and then they sort of went back. I mean, it's it's, it's a hard thing to do. So we have one here, one here, and then Dr. King is going to get the last. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Jack Demarchio, a former 
Since we've got the Under Secretary of Homeland Security for Intelligence. Um, I've heard a lot of things here uh, regarding the types of activities the Russians are engaged in. I've heard organized crime, I've heard child pornography, I've heard a defensive uh, posture against Wahhabis or Arabs. Um, and I guess my question really runs to their priorities. What, if anything, are, are the priorities of the Russian cyber capabilities? Are they defensive? Are they to guard against an Arab Spring or perceived Arab Spring? Are they uh, collection? And if they are collection, are, are they collecting on our critical infrastructure? Um, what exactly, if you can, are their priorities? And how do you rank that? Good unanswerable question. When <laughs> um, <laughs> Michelle puts your head down. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not sure that these are either or questions. I think it's kind of all of the above, depending upon what category you're talking about. Uh, I certainly can't speak to their intelligence priorities or anything. I have full knowledge. Certainly, um, uh, on the foreign policy side, which is this attempt to promulgate this new code of conduct, there seems it, it, the swiftness with which this document was spit out and ended up in some place without prior knowledge, and we have bilateral activities with them on a pretty regular basis, and we're, we talk a lot. And so the, for them to put a major international document on the table without showing it to us first, that suggests a degree of concern about Arab Spring, getting control, sovereignty issue, uh, getting control in the international space over internet freedom issues and things like that, and pushing back. It also indicates that they're kind of willing to walk away from uh, a the patch of common ground we demarked in, uh, in uh, 2010. So that suggests to me a degree of heightened concern uh, internationally that I don't know how it compares to some of their other priorities, but that would suggest that there's an elevated concern. I want to say a couple of words about myself. In uh, Russia, cyber policy issue, cyber security, uh, not cyber, the information security. This, uh, this is the securitized. What I say that, uh, what does it mean that they're securitized? This concept is coming from the very goes on. Most of the new public and non this the securitization is that uh, when the number one person is involved, then it becomes the new generation of security issues. So they are paranoid about this. So what's happened, even if we look at the chronology of, of this, I mean, from 2000 till now, I mean, what kind of action and trying to elevate your power is formulated in the strategic documents. Uh, uh, attack about, against Estonia, by, against Lithuania, for example, when the government banned the Soviet symbols against, uh, against Georgia. I mean, and now they are concerned, I mean, they are paranoid what's happening in Arab Spring, uh, uh, in the uh, London riots. I mean, they, are, they, they think that their perception is so, this is social media issue now. And so, um, that's why sort of the statement uh, uh, from the new president about this and you not know, only from the president, from the um, um, Chinovnik uh, made regarding this issue. Uh, so uh, from what we see, how they act, uh, that we can determine their uh, policy as a very offensive. And it's not all about the little countries, it's about some, you know, in. Uh, 1999 in London Sunday time wrote that um, um, so something like this the United States officials believe that uh, um, uh, Russian attack on a uh, military uh, secret and there was a big attack on to, such as like the naval intelligence called and um, um, also in 2003 there was an attack and uh, RBM is this uh, possibly, I mean, uh, suspicious sort of in this attack as well. So what we see that, uh, I mean, what's happening in this regard that we could, we should determine uh, based on the open source what, what, what is going on, that they, they are cyber, they are cyber policy, their information, 
policies offensive is offensive and what we are putting in the nation of Iran in the terms of the Shahid Population Organization, the new extension of UNG, new conduct program of uh, information security called the Point of Information Security. I mean uh, Geneva Cyber Convention. There is I mean this is not going to work. And why and only the effective documents is the Commission or the European Commission Cyber Conference. They are not joined because of very simple reason it applies Thank you, sir. Uh, Major Kurt Sanger, I'm a law instructor at Marine Corps University. I was wondering if there's a consensus either from this panel or the larger community of individuals who are working on this issue. Um, does international law cover what's being considered right now, particularly within the area of sovereignty? Is there any uh, belief that you're kind of beyond international law, that it can apply to every situation, or are there creative answers or creative solutions being uh, developed to address these things that might not fall in with the traditional law of conflict and international law rules? Well, certainly it's the policy position of the U.S. government that certainly with respect to LOAC, it applies to cyberspace. Um, as I said earlier, um, and the issue is how it applies. How do we define issues like proportionality and distinction? With respect to other uh, types of cyber issues, um, we think that basic fundamental principles that the U.S. has adhered to across the board, fundamental freedoms, rights to self-defense, all of those things also apply. Could we imagine that there are norms because of this unique technology that uh, need to be discussed? The answer is yes. In the U.S. International Strategy for Cyberspace, which was put out over the summer, um, uh, we, we identify norms um, that are information technology specific, like requiring international interoperability, things like that, uh, which are probably not covered by existing international law per se, but sometime in the future might be promulgated as international standards somewhere like in the ITU. Um, but uh, could we imagine something not covered by international law? Perhaps, but I'm not sure we've done an exhaustive search. There is a uh, very good young international lawyer uh, who until recently worked at the uh, NATO Center of Excellence in Thailand. Her name is Anakin T. She is um, working on, well, she's they've published, and we have somebody from Estonia here who can probably direct you to a link. And they published two books that gave, one of the books is the International Legal Basis of Cyber, and looked at a variety of things. It also looked at all the conflicts that have occurred thus far, including Estonia and Georgia, and how it, from an international legal point of view. She's also working on a 400-page tome with 20 other international lawyers that's everything international law about cyber. So I would suggest uh, finding her in that document, which I think is in its final preparation. It's on the website. It's on the website. Well, if you can talk to Helen there, um, she can probably direct you to where you can find those resources, because they're tremendous resources. Anakin Teak, T-I-K-K, and E-N-E-K-E-N. Roger, can you have the last word? <laughs> uh, Roger, the pressure for uh, incredible wisdom is on you. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, can you sign advisor for the Sovereign Bank Matter 10th Fleet? Uh, I've got two questions for the pastor and I turn on one from Ms. Markoff. Uh, first, okay, the. Yeah, one I thought question. you had one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked before uh, about uh, inclinations. Um, it seems like the RBN is still utilizing. Cyber is just a new venue for traditional uh, criminal activities, fraud, theft. Um, are they actually just being bridging out to things like cyber network exfiltration, or is that wholly the province of uh, our trading partners to the West? Okay, and are you going to do them? As, uh, let's get them all on. Come on, <laughs> Roger. <laughs> the next question is, given the fact the RBN is uh, focused on making money, 
But then again, you have this uh, cognitive dissonance where they had this paranoia of the hobbyist and the Arabs. Uh, but what would be the, the possibility of RBN being subcontracted by an international uh, organization like uh, Hamas or Al Qaeda? Or would that be crossing the line with those concentric circles that you were talking about? And then last but not least, um, it's Marco. We talk about uh, laws of international conflict. And I was like using historical analogies because a lot of people I deal with view themselves as warrior historians. And um, I draw an analogy to uh, these, uh, these safe havens, like uh, civilian critical infrastructure. And I draw attention to post-World War I concept of strategic bombing. We had H.G. Wells talking about using poisonous gas to go after whole uh, uh, civilian populations, as well as a predecessor in Naval Chamberlain talking about that there's no defense against um, strategic bombing. All you do is kill everybody else's women and children faster than they do and kill and basically end their, uh, their, uh, their impulse to continue war. Um, is there a concern that in just like strategic bombing overcame the, uh, the speed of legislation, like when the Hedgehog bombers bombed London instead of the uh, uh, <coughs> the man World War II, the start of the whole tip for tat in World War II, that there may be a situation where if there's a fire day sale, um, that um, respective uh, nationalities may just forget about uh, legislation and preserving these, uh, these civilian infrastructure as being offered <coughs> based on the circumstances. Uh, well, let's bring, <laughs> let's bring in von Clausewitz as well, <laughs> targeting centers of gravity, and bring in the, Dresd the bombing of Dresden as well, because that's one of the current sources of international humanitarian law. Um, yeah, I mean, there are evil people in every generation, in every place, and I think that customary international law has developed over time in order to prevent the most heinous instincts of man, and I emphasize man, um, uh, from, from coming out to, um, uh, to attack one another. Uh, it's only by the will of of um, sovereign states who hold these values dear that we can try to enforce. And that's, I guess, why we go to war sometimes, because you have bad people who will not do that. But I'm very hopeful, and what we tried to do in 2010 is to say exactly that these laws, in fact, would prevent the indiscriminate victimization of civilian critical infrastructures that might result in death. A question such as, what constitutes an act of force in cyberspace, I predict will never be answered except in the eye of the beholder. I think spending a lot of time to try to define that uh, would be a fool's uh, You know, but it's one of these, like pornography, we'll know it when we see it type of thing. And I think it has to do with scope, duration, and effect. But, um, uh, you know, I think that targeting of civilians is a bad thing, and I continue to say, state those things, and there are many countries that agree with it. Okay. Roger, the, uh, if you, you, you asked me and Tuna relatively easy questions, then you throw in the shell. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the answer to your first one, you know, is there any evidence of the of RBN? And I would just specify RBN, as far as we know, has, has disappeared. Clearly, people of their ilk are Baby out there. RBNs. Um, oh, by the way, the, some of the principles of RBN had turned up in Kyrgyzstan uh, with some attacks on Kyrgyzstan and appear to be operating in China on some of these pharmacy things. So we know the individuals. RBN itself seems to be seems to be gone, but obviously there's other criminal syndicates. Uh, I see. I see no evidence that they're branching out. Uh, I mean, I think they're in multi-billion-dollar businesses uh, right now. I don't see any evidence of them getting into more sophisticated kind of stuff. That doesn't mean they're not. I just I haven't seen it. Um, as far as renting themselves out to enemies of the Russian state. I don't see that happening. I think that violates the, the code. And uh, you know, you, you, you will not be in business. You will be prosecuted for child pornography, uh, for pharmacy scams, and everything else uh, very, very quickly if you start doing that. I would be more worried that somebody um, sort of individuals migrate from something like RBN 
and end up working for someone else at some point. We've always had a problem with that with Russian brain power, sort of ending up doing something where an individual is hired by someone else. It was more a case when they were very poor during the Yeltsin years. But uh, I think that would be a total <coughs> violation of the deal. And I think there's enough people uh, like Khodorkovsky who could tell you what happens when you violate the deal. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Katrina Mishvigabadze and Michelle Markov, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you here again.